You're listening to Kill Cliff's Hazard Ground Podcast with service members from across the military sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week. Before we get started with this week's episode, an amazing story that was made into a movie and certainly one that you all are very familiar with. We will get to that in just a moment. But first, a couple of quick words as we get ready for the episode. Don't forget to follow us on all of our social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hazard Ground at Hazard Ground Podcast. Subscribe to our YouTube channel as well where you can watch all of our podcast episodes. And don't forget about our promotion with Amazon on our website, hazardground.com. You can go right there, click on the Amazon button at the bottom of the homepage or into the sponsors tab. It'll send you right to your uh, Amazon page and your Amazon account. You can do all of your normal Amazon shopping, especially with the holidays coming up. You'll certainly be able to uh, get all your shopping done very easily. But when you do that, we'll get a promotion of what you guys spend and then we'll donate a, a portion of that percentage back to some of the great charities featured here on the hazard ground as I'm tongue tied of my own promotion that I tell you guys about every single week. So again, works the same on your smartphone. If you go to hazardground.com, it redirects you right to the app. So all your credit card information is saved. Very simple, very convenient. Uh, please leave us a review on Apple podcasts, continue to grow the hazard ground community. These reviews help us and they push us towards the top of the Apple podcast as they send out to the rest of the world. Don't forget to download the kill cliff TV app and don't forget about kill cliff clean energy drinks, uh, great friends of the show, Navy SEAL Foundation, started by a former Navy SEAL. This is the killer cliff sickle right here. Clean CBD products. Again, uh, just some of the best energy drinks. I use Kill Cliff, the non-CBD version, because I'm still serving and I don't want to take CBD at this point. But nonetheless, their pre-workout, post-workout drinks are amazing. All clean energy, best products that I've ever used, and I work out a ton. So again, check out killcliff.com and download the Kill Cliff TV app. All right, on to this week's episode. If you are familiar with the movie Restrepo, this is a story or this individual's personal story. After 19 years still serving in the military, he is currently stationed at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. He has 13 combat deployments. He's got multiple awards and decorations. And his story, again, cataloged both in Restrepo and the movie Korngal, multiple books as well. He is Colonel Dan Kearney joining us here on the Hazard Ground. Uh, Colonel, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. No, I appreciate it, Mark. I uh, look forward to having a conversation with you guys today. And uh Really proud to be able to offer something to, to some of those veterans and uh, and some of those folks out there that are listening. Yeah, and for those who don't know, you are a graduate of North Georgia College, and so me as a Georgia Guardsman have bumped elbows with many of your alumni. Uh, the pride of, of Georgia, uh, you know, military commissioning is the Georgia North Georgia North North Georgia College. Excuse me. Yeah, we like to call it the West Point of uh, of Georgia. You know, when I'm talking with my friends, but uh, no, it's it's definitely uh, an institution that I'm proud to have uh, been able to attend. I met my wife there, and uh, and got a lot of great memories from from Dahlonega in the in the Atlanta northern region. Yeah, uh, I went to a wedding up in Dahlonega, right in the mountains up there, and I'm like, it's the first time I'd ever been up there for for either North Georgia, and then referencing like you know mountain phase of Ranger School, and I'm like, no wonder why nobody wants to be up here. Like this is miserable. It is. I actually had the opportunity to recycle ranger school in Dahlonega during the mountain phase, uh, during best ranger competition. So an elongated stay up there at the same time that my wife was only about a mile and a half away from the, the ranger camp. So I, I've got a lot of good and bad memories of Dahlonega as it, as it goes, unfortunately. <laughs> so how does the young Dan Kearney end up at North Georgia College? Yeah, you, I mean, the bottom line up front is uh, I'm an Army brat, so I've... Uh, I've had the opportunity to travel and follow in my father's footsteps as he served for 36 years in the Army. Uh, wanted to go to West Point, uh, just didn't do very well in uh, school and in terms of the test taken to be able to go ahead and break through and, and get, a, get into West Point. Started at University of South Carolina, and, uh, and like most SEC schools, I was having a little bit too much fun. And as a result, uh, I realized I probably needed some structure in my life, and the ROTC there wasn't going to do it. Made a phone call to North Georgia because I had some friends that went there. And uh, a year later, I found myself uh, going to North Georgia, being treated like a frog, which is a, a freshman. And I uh, spent the next three years there before I got my commission and, and joined the Army as an infantry officer. 
Now you signed up in, in a post 9-11 world. Did I was commissioned a couple of years before you were. Um, did any of that deter you or your family saying, hey, you know, uh, maybe we want to go to a different you want to go a different route here? You know, it was it was very unique being at North Georgia because the school at the time, if you were male, you were required to be in the core cadets. And uh, oddly enough, I think the girl to guy ratio was something like eight to nine. So there was a there was an increased uh, return on investment for me going to that school. Uh, but at the same token, when 9-11 happened, I was a junior in college uh, walking into classes and started hearing the, the discussions going on uh, about an airplane hitting the towers and an unknown size and unknown damage. And quickly, what I realized on that day was not only are there a lot of similar minded folks like me that went to North Georgia because they wanted to serve, but number two, a lot of the, the girls uh, were army brats themselves. So there was this commonality at North Georgia that I found at that moment in time, that really just solidified my decision um, and my desire to, to serve our country and to, and to join the Army. Uh, I spent the rest of the day surrounded by friends that were all Army brats, and, and, and we talked about where our fathers were at the time, somewhere at the Pentagon. My father was actually forward in a foreign country uh, doing some other business, and uh, like everybody else, very, very tough to, to deal with that day. And then even tougher if your father was in in harm's way and you weren't able to get in touch with him. So like I said in the beginning, I, I think it was one of those things that really solidified my decision uh, and made it that much more easy for me to go ahead and do what it is that I've been doing for the last 19 years. So once you commission, um, you're headed where? Yeah, so commission, uh, I end up going down to Fort Benning, Georgia. Uh, I do the whole infantry officer basic course, ranger school, airborne school, pipeline, and find myself uh, moving out to Fort Lewis, Washington, where I'm joining what is only the the second striker brigade to to enter into the armed services. Yeah. And really new piece of equipment and immediately get thrust into deploying to Mosul, Iraq uh, at the time that uh, we saw the probably the, the height of the, the escalation in Iraq after the invasion. Uh, you just saw Fallujah fall uh, as I was coming in there and Mosul started to receive a lot of the miscreants that had left Fallujah and, and fled north to Talafar in the Mosul region. And we were dealing with suicide vehicle bombers and uh, the likes of that in a higher propensity than maybe those down in Baghdad we're seeing with IEDs um, and V-beds just because it was that much more open. And I, I think that that was kind of where the, where it came through from maybe some of our adversaries to the north and east of, of where I was located at. Um, and that, that cemented me for 12 months. Uh, I was a platoon leader, an interim company commander for almost a month when my company commander uh, ended up getting killed. And then later the second one ended up getting sent home uh, because of a vehicle born ID that, that hit, hit him and, and maimed him from head to toe. Wow. So uh, uh, unique 12 months there. Yeah. I, I, I want to back up to say, I guess where I was sort of asked the question better, where I was leading with it was as you're going through all that training, right? I mean, like our generation of warriors, right? The ones who, who got in, in right around nine 11, you know, there's a gap there between, you know, major combat and what we were going into. Even the Gulf War veterans were, were slim and few and far between because it just didn't last that long. And I was just curious if you had run into any of those guys from the time you commissioned throughout your training. Was there a sense of people who were talking to you saying, hey, LT, listen, you got to get ready for a whole different world that you're not ready for kind of deal. What was sort of that, you know, mindset as you were going through all the training? leading up to when you first deployed? Yeah, another great question, Mark. And uh, I don't think I thought about it that way. Um, very unique while we were spending, you know, I think it was 18 weeks at IOBC. Um, few people had deployed at that point in time because it was 2002. Uh, the initial invasion into Afghanistan was only uh, a few short months ahead of that. 
Uh, we hadn't committed to Iraq at that point in time. So again, we were, we were just, we were just becoming this nation that was entering into a war and few had seen it. Uh, but we all knew we were on the precipice of, of becoming a nation that was going to be fully engrossed with this long-term, this long-term war. And the discussions about Iraq were already starting to, to fuel. So a, a ton of, discussion about that throughout that 18 weeks but i think it really started to hit me when i was in the the first phase of ranger school mm -hmm. and during that phase is when iraq was at a tight and during that phase we also saw the 173rd jump into uh northern iraq and into kirkuk and you're surrounded by young ranger privates and specialists that are talking about Oh, my battalion's already over there and I'm stuck here at Ranger School. Um, you're talking to people that are assigned to the 173rd that are your peers as lieutenants and they're getting ready. Hey, as soon as they're done with this, they're getting ready to go meet their unit in, in combat. And so I think it, it switched everybody's, you know, head on a, a little bit tighter um, and, and had us focus in that much more on this. Uh, the RIs, you know, they... They didn't beat it into us physically, but they they reiterated, hey, this is this is the last time that you're going to get that touch point for training potentially before you all get to go out there. Make right. your mistakes now, learn from them, and go forward and do great things after this. But hey, you got to pay attention now, Ranger. Um, so so that's that's kind of what it was like for me. Um, I'm sure that that transitioned over the years as you continue to see more and more of us deploying forward and then coming back to the trade doc units to, to train coach and, and mentor these young men and women that were coming through these, these pipelines. But I think it was just, Hey, we had a focus on it. We didn't know what we specifically had to focus on because there weren't enough of those that were teaching us that had combat experience. Number two, we realized that, Hey, because of this last time of training, we really couldn't squander any of it on any nonsense. And then third and foremost was, hey, you don't know what it is that's going to happen when you get to your next unit. So you need to show up ready to rock and roll. Um, and, and that's what I think everybody during my timeline kind of faced when they were going through that pipeline. Yeah, I mean, it's such a... Uh interesting pivot because you know look i did four years of rotc you know, granted you're at a military academy um it's still a regular college but it's you know obviously with the focus where it is um and and they beat into you as cadets right about leadership right because that's the craft you're learning in a garrison environment right that's that's the craft you're learning to be a leader but leading in garrison and leading in combat are two completely different things and and it, it requires a a bit of nuance and almost a different skill set to be able to do that. Um, and I know just speaking personally, you know, I had spent so much time working on being a leader that when I first deployed, like it just became something different. It was a different way to make people understand because, you know, the idea of somebody dying in combat was fairly foreign to me, right? Like it, 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 I didn't go to ranger school. I didn't do all those things that, that you got an opportunity to do. Um, and so no one ever looked at me and said, look, you're going to get people killed. And then you realize as you start going through train up, you know, for, for deployment and, and someone's telling you, look, you're going to get somebody killed. And then all of a sudden, you know, you start to realize the gravity of the whole situation. I was 25 when I first deployed. You were a 20, what, 21, 22 year old kid, 23 year old. I, I just think there's, that there's a lot that's sitting on your plate that you probably mentally couldn't digest a hundred percent. I'm going to, I'm going to jump a few years ahead and maybe it'll relate. I don't think it fully hit me until I had, uh, until I had a son. Makes sense. Um, when I became a father, I realized probably more than I ever did, even after a 12 month deployment of what the impacts of my decisions had on families and other people's loved ones. Sure. Um, you're making, you're making decisions that impact America's most precious resource. And your decisions aren't just going to impact that one individual's life or that the lives of your unit that you're leading, uh, but they got brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, parents, grandparents, and, and, and it starts to finally take hold. And, and, and I'm a firm believer that if you're a, a parent, uh, 
you inherently understand and appreciate those leadership roles more just because of the nature of, of what you've gone through by having to, to relate to taking care of your own son or daughter. Um, I, I don't know if that relates to you, but that's the best way that I can tell you that when it really hit me, uh, because I went through my first deployment, I didn't lose a single person, but I definitely saw a number of human beings and, and I lost a number of friends and, and watched a number of them be maimed. And I wasn't, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't callous to it. I wasn't uh, making these decisions uninformed and unaware. Uh, but I, I think that it, it just became that much clearer when I had a son over. Yeah, you know, and certainly I didn't deploy with children. So I, I was fortunate in that aspect, but certainly uh, now that I am a father, it, it changes the, the, the complete aperture with which you're looking through life in general, but certainly as it pertains to, to other people's children that you're charged with bringing home safely. Um, and you mentioned that you didn't, uh, you didn't lose anybody in your unit, but you, as people started falling, you started taking casualties. Is there a moment for you that where you look back on it and, and you start to realize that, you know, either maybe this is more than I bargained for or, that real got real and, you know, the gravity of realness sort of can, can be overwhelming. There are, there are several points throughout my first two deployments where uh, that hit me. Uh, the first, uh, I can't remember the date right now, largely because I probably choose to forget more than I'd like. <laughs> um, the Mosul Chow Hall, December 22nd or 23rd, uh, had a suicide bomber uh, detonate himself while I was walking in with my platoon into the Chow Hall after a patrol. And the first person that I saw was my best friend, Drew Coughlin, who was the company XO. And he was sitting right across the table from my company commander who died instantly. Um, when you walk, when I walked into the Chow Hall and started triaging people and I couldn't I couldn't tell the difference between what was food and what was people. Right. You know, it didn't hit right then, but it hit later on when I had time to go ahead and, and think about it. Um, when you're, you know, I, I fast forward and a couple months later, I have an incredibly close friend who's a sister platoon leader of mine in, uh, in a company that I'm serving in. Um, incredibly religious man, incredibly physically fit and just great family. And he goes blind as a result of a suicide vehicle born ID that detonates in front of him. A guy named Scotty Smiley, who's, who's got a great book out there called, uh, I believe it's unseen. And you just start to question, Hey, like this man who has these just deep feelings uh, that are rooted in, in, in a religious understanding with God. He's physically fit, incredibly intelligent, got a great family. Like this can happen to any, any one of us. Um, and then the third one is uh, a gentleman that uh, was my battalion commander at the time and that I'd known since I was three or four years old uh, was shot chasing down a, a, uh, a, a miscreant. Uh, that had uh, been shooting at them earlier in the day. And we lost our battalion commander to injuries and to wounds. And he had to deploy and go home. And I mean, my kids call him uncle to this day because I've known him so oh. long and my family's known him so long. So like in that first deployment, there was these three moments. Yeah. Where I had to like sit there and question and, and reevaluate some things. But I, I think that, the biggest thing that I, I saw was that young men and women in those times, they yearn for leadership, they yearn for guidance and direction. And while I wasn't the best at it, I did well enough to be able to take care of them. Um, and I brought every, every single one of them home. Um, and I thought that I was I was doing them a, a service by staying in there and continuing and that I would have been doing a disservice if I didn't take that experience and continue to impart that on other folks uh, as I continue to go and serve uh, down the road. 
You, you hit on something that's that's quite seminal from the standpoint of you know the old adage of just control what you can control, right? Um, and sometimes in the chaos of combat where there are many things out of your control, all you can control is your own actions, and hopefully those things have the right second and third order of effects that we are trained to have them have, right? And and everybody benefits from that. Um, you know, and that was the only thing. Whenever I got into, uh, you know, there were there were moments before I would leave the wire uh, where I would just be overcome with like, today's a day. Like, I, I can't be on the road this much. You know, in 05 and 06, when I was in Iraq, it was the height of, you know, road bomb season. <laughs> uh, right. And, and uh, you know, I was outside the, the, the wire three or four days a week, just continually logging miles, running convoys back and forth. And I would have these sinking feelings like today's a day. Something's got to, it's got, something bad's got to happen. We can't just keep rolling the dice and not crap out. But I, I say all this because those moments when getting ready and prepping all the vehicles and everything, I would find myself finding a quiet place, walking around the back of a building and just taking a couple of deep breaths. Cause I didn't want anybody to see, you know, me start to sweat. I didn't want anybody to see the nervousness on my face that there was something eating me up inside. And so I just go say a little prayer. And all I ever asked was just do what you're trained to do. Like in the moment, just do what you are trained to do. And that's the most I could control and that's all I ever wanted to do was be able to do what I was trained to do and do the right thing in the moment and protect the people around me. Everything else, the chips will follow, they may, but that was literally the only thing I could control. And from that standpoint, I think that was the best. When I talk about leadership in combat versus leadership in garrison, you know, those are the things that the people you lead expect you to do the right thing and the thing that is going to tactically and hopefully technically keep everybody alive and, and, and safe as long as possible. It's, I mean, you're hitting the nail on the head, Mark. It's, uh, something that that I think all of us go through, and if you don't, then uh, might not be human. <laughs> then that you might not be human, uh, and and therefore I, I don't know that I want you leading my son or daughter in combat. Uh, but I, I did similar thing. Uh, there's a there's a picture out there from our time in Mosul. Uh, like like many sports teams in high school, you would circle around and, and you may or may not say, but mine did, they would say the Our Father before going out to, uh, to you know, play on the pitch or, or play on the field. And my way of kind of getting everybody at ease, taking a deep breath and like level in the playing field so that we could all go out there and, and, and do what we were supposed to do and clear our minds. And I'm not a very religious person, but it was just something that I, I knew that I could used to to bring that commonality across the team because so many of them were were sports uh, athletes in high school was to take a knee before we got onto the striker and say the our father um i i had watched it as soon as we landed in iraq and in talafar we were tasked with my platoon escorting all of the battalions equipment and trains from talafar to mosul like within 48 hours of landing there and you know, as a brand new young lieutenant with a brand new platoon in combat, you know, that, that seemed incredibly overwhelming. Like you said, driving up and down like route Tampa and in, in the height of I, IED season, it was just yeah. the unknown. And our company commander and our first sergeant just did not give us that, that calming sense that we needed. Uh, you know, they're like, Hey, take a look at your left and right and, and memorize that, that guy or gal's face. And I was like, that is not what I want. I want them to tell me to like, close with and destroy the enemy and to like be confident that I'm going to be able to come out on this on the other end because you're trained, you're armed to the teeth. And because like behind you is like the three horsemen of the apocalypse. And they just happen to be wearing U S army uniforms and wearing the same patch that you are on your left shoulder. So go out there and get some. Um, I don't know if that resonates with you, but, that's kind of what it is that I needed. I, I needed that like high school football coach pitch to like commit me and, and go forward and do great things. And then I needed something to kind of like level me out. And that's what I found worked best for me as a platoon leader. But I'll tell you when I couldn't do that with the boys, when I became a company commander and I was stretched out across the corn gall, it was incredibly hard for me to, to have the pulse uh, and to, to be able to measure how to give them purpose, direction, and motivation in an, in a very uncertain place where the very first combat deployment or combat um, operation that we did out of the water wire, I, I lost the brigade command sergeant major son. Oh, God. Just ripple effects. And only hours earlier, 
the brigade command sergeant major was like hugging me and, and telling me how proud he was that his son was in my company and, you know, at the tip of the spear. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just one of those things you, you don't know how to, you don't know how to measure that. You don't know how to do it. So, uh, I applaud you for, for taking that deep breath, asking for some help and, uh, and then kind of, I'm sure in your own way, you imparted that same kind of like level headedness can do kind of purpose, direction and motivation to your, to your boys and gals before you guys went out there. Um, that, that was the hard thing for me in the corn gall. And then the, the second thing with that, and I'm kind of going off topic here was just, you probably heard it. It's the mantle of command. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm in an austere environment. I've got four platoons underneath my command. We've already lost soldiers on the very first day. We're in contact every single day. And the guys are, are questioning what the hell are we doing here? And I'm 26, 27 years old. And they're like, what the heck does this guy know about doing this kind of war fighting? He just spent a year in Mosul driving around in a truck. This is not Mosul. Uh, this is a little bit different. And you can't complain up the chain of command. You can't complain down the chain of command. You're constantly, you know, worried about what messaging and narrative that you're, you're spinning uh, because you, you've got to be able to keep everybody focused on the fight, even when you don't necessarily understand it any better than they might. Um, and, and so those were the two things that I, I struggled with the most, with how do I provide that purpose, direction, and motivation when I might not even understand it? And where's that outlet that I have to be able to have an ability to have this conversation with somebody when I'm in this austere location that uh, that doesn't afford me the opportunity to talk with peers let alone any anybody else that uh that i that i felt that i could i could confide and trust in sure and and that you know uh, i can't imagine i mean look i host a podcast i'm a talker right like it's 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 sort of my being and i was fortunate enough to be in an environment where i always had counsel i always had people peers and even even superiors i could go to and and ask questions, uh, and, and at least, you know, try to understand things. Cause I, I've told this story before in the podcast. I remember having a conversation with a major, um, you know, after going back and forth and doing all these convoys and you're getting, you know, fights and this, that, and the other, and, you know, you start to look at, uh, you know, one of my jobs was training the Iraqi special operations forces brigade. And, and, you know, you're starting to see advances and, and some of it's good and some of it's bad and, you know, being contemplative and just sort of doing some critical thought, you know, I, I kept having these thoughts of like, you know, it, 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 they're never going to get this. Like they're never just going to be able to do what we do. I mean, you know, and, you know, I, I just remember asking this major at the time as I was a captain, and I just said, I'm like, what's the purpose of this? Like th this, this all seems like a waste. And the major simply said to me, small victories, Mark, take the victories where you can get them and take the ones that count and don't worry about everything else. You're not going to win this war by yourself. Nobody's going to win this war by themselves. Take the victories that you can get when you can get them and just keep building. And it was a really simple piece of advice that I never forgot all these years later. Now it's what, 15 years later since my last first deployment. Um, but it always stuck with me that small victories matter. Um, they do because it's things you can build on. And it's sometimes it's those small victories that give your troops what they need to keep on going. And so that mantle of command that you talked about, where for me, it was always I was I understood command was you're responsible for everything your unit does, but it was also the things that they failed to do was the mantle of command that I always struggled with because, oh, well, it didn't happen. How could it be my, it is your fault. That's what being in command means, you know, like that's the burden of the whole thing. And so you can't ever escape that. Um, but those small victories, I think provide a lot of, uh, you know, lack of a better term, a dangling carrot for people just to keep going forward. Oh, they, they, they do. And I mean, I, um, I think I even started to, to drink my own Kool-Aid for lack of a better term <laughs> is uh, I kind of described it to the, to the guys. It just so happened that there was only guys out there with me in this unit in the corn gall, but, but this stuff moves at the speed of glacial thaw. And so in the corn gall, we're, we're fighting to really try to go ahead and keep the enemy at bay from being on a much, uh, much larger valley floor, which was known as the Pesh to our north, which was where there was some kind of commerce going on. And it was a little bit, for whatever you can, be urban in, uh, in Afghanistan and in, in Kunar, but a, a little more urban, 
uh, and more densely populated. And the intent was to be able to go ahead and keep the enemy where we were in the Korngal so that the battalion and the brigade could do the things that they needed to do in the Pesh. That doesn't necessarily translate really well to the boys or to their families. Right. And then so we, we started trying to push a road. And I honest to God think that we moved the road in 15 months, maybe like 20 feet. And so, you know, when I talk about glacial thaw, that that's that was my best analogy is like, hey, boys, like we made another foot this month. That's great. Um, but it, it it was hard to go ahead and, and do that until we got into a position where we were able to no longer be the hunted and we were able to transition to a phase where we were hunting them. And, and what I mean there is we really fell in on the Korngal Valley and in the, the bases that were, were already set and had to kind of figure our way through the valley, understanding the enemy, understanding uh, the advantages of the terrain. And we realized early on that we were at the base of the valley and we needed to come up to the top. Um, why? Because the best way that I could an analogize it to the boys, like that's where helicopters are. That's where we can get some fires. That's where we can get some of our own like eyes on. And when we're on the top, it's like king of the hill. We'll be able to control the valley from up there. So we started building those bases like Restrepo. Mm -hmm. And, and those, those men, they worked like slaves. Um, and I still expected them to go out each and every day uh, because I was a firm believer that uh, the best defense is having an even a better offense. And if we were going out every day, then we would condition the enemy to always expect us to be outside the wire and not to be just hunkered down and allow them to get closer and closer to us. Um, and it didn't, didn't seem like we flipped the switch and we were able to start hunting them um, until after a, a large operation known as Rock Avalanche. Um, and, and until after we were able to establish OP Restrepo up on top of a, a significant piece of terrain in, in the southern portion of the valley. You've, you obviously mentioned it, uh, Restrepo and, and Korngal and, and Pesh in, in, in Afghanistan. So let's just dive into that. Um, I know you mentioned you were at Fort Lewis. When do you actually get to the 173rd uh, and how quickly from there, when you get there, do you end up in Afghanistan? Yeah, so get to the 173rd in the summer of 2006. Okay. And I transition into command uh about five short months later did you did you know you were going into command when you got there or they gave it to you after you had got there no i i, I got there i knew that i was going there to compete for command okay. uh but i was sitting on staff as the plans officer as the uh 173rd brigade plans officer in the three shop mm -hmm. and colonel bill oslin was the battalion commander for 2503 and it's already been courting me and, and, and telling me that he wanted me down at his battalion and thereabouts of November of that year in 2006, I took command of battle company um, who had had a, a rough go of it only a year earlier uh, down in central Afghanistan. And we were actually training up to go to Iraq because it was at the height of the surge. Yes. And mm -hmm. we were planning on going to Iraq and, and, you know, driving around in vehicles. And while we were at our culminating training exercise in Germany, we got the word during our live fire that we were going to be transitioning from Iraq to Afghanistan. And at the time, more people were dying in the army of motorcycle accidents than they were in Afghanistan. Yep. And there was almost a collective sigh of relief that we weren't going to Iraq, but we were going to Afghanistan. I remember actually thinking that while I was deployed in 05 and 06, like, what the hell's going on in Afghanistan? Like, I, I would almost rather be there right now than driving through Sadr City. Like, you know, the, the idea of either going to Fallujah, Ramadi, or Sadr City, uh, you could have dropped me in, in, in the Pesh Valley, and I would have been like, all right, this is better. Yeah, 100%. I, I, at, at the time, I would have totally said that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then you fast forward, uh, like, I think it was three – three months later and we're flying into the Korngal Valley. And I don't, I don't know that there was anything that could have prepared us for what it is that 
uh, we embarked on for the next 15 months. Um, I got to ask you one thing real quick, and I'm sorry to cut you off, but yeah, go ahead. We have, we have told the story of Cop Keating a half dozen times from several different points of view, and I asked the same question. I'll ask it of you because everything you learned tactically to this point in your career, you know, the basic 101 of tactics, don't seed the high ground. And you are flying in to this place and they're going to go, we're going to put you right down here at the bottom of a place that's surrounded pretty much on all sides by high ground. Uh, and somebody way up in the military thought that this was a good idea. So I, I ask you, as you are getting to go into this place, are you literally going, who the fuck thought of this? I, I felt like it was. It's got to be a joke, right? Like it's a setup. Oh yeah. It was like, it was like fish in a barrel. I, I felt <laughs> like they were going to just club baby seals. Um, don't get me wrong. I mean, I can see now and I can understand and I can make the argument of, of why you needed that because you, you sure. couldn't land helicopters on the pinnacle of some of these, these mountaintops and you need to be able to resupply and et cetera. But uh, I, I firmly believe that once you've got that lodgement, you've got to be able to expand and go up uh, because you're going to, you're going to see the high ground. And that's exactly what we did with Restrepo and, and why we had to take it. I mean, I, the high ground where Restrepo was at was where the enemy was walking up on the backside of the mountain and shooting down into another base, amputated uh, one of my squad leaders, uh, wounded several others. And at that point in time, I was just like, enough's enough. Um, we're going to have to go up here and we're going to have to take this. And you, you, you've got to create measures. It's like, hey, we're going to go up on top of this mountain in the middle of the night. We're going to build a fighting position. But men forced to hold this fighting position once the sun comes up is that we've got to have some cover and concealment uh, to, the, to the south and to the east and west. And we've got to have one machine gun position in place. If we don't have that, then we're going to retrograde and we'll try to do it again. Uh, and luckily enough, we held to our men force. We met it. Uh, but for the next day, when we when we did that, it was like we we stuck a big metal finger up to the enemy because in the span of that 24 hours, we had 13 separate troops in contact events trying to knock us off the top of that hill. Wow. And by the grace of God, because we had that 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 men force that I required to go ahead and occupy and maintain, uh, we only had one soldier get shot. Um, did you come up with this plan? Like, did you talk to your bosses and say, look, we need to do this to execute. Otherwise we're going to be, you know, as you said, fishing a barrel, we're going to be dead down here. So uh, was that something that you guys had come up or, or it came down from above to do it? No, I mean, this was completely, this was completely on us. Right. Um, okay. And identifying this. I mean, you, you, it's like I said early on, you had to go ahead and understand the terrain. And until right. you understood the train and you were willing to walk out there and push past it and, and kind of hang yourself out there, um, you couldn't appreciate where you needed to be in order to deny the enemy freedom to maneuver in the valley. Um, and, and we had to do that in, in a couple areas, to be honest with you, Mark. And, you know, things like Camp Keating and, and some of these other incredibly harrowing uh, events that took place in, in Afghanistan and in Iraq, for that matter. I, I think it's the deck of cards you get. And, and what I mean when I say that is, is when we came into the Korengal, I mean, we were battle-hardened and tested, tested probably more so than most units in the Army within the first 30 days. Because every single day we were in a new tick and in multiple ticks that were usually synchronized that were usually uh, coupled with indirect fire and direct fire and it, they were complex and I don't know that everybody gets those same kind of experiences and so when you don't have that and you're not accustomed to it and you don't understand how to go ahead and react and you don't know where you're supposed to have your weapons laid and and how to best go ahead and manage that kind of fight sometimes the enemy you know, gets the upper hand and they're able to go ahead and take advantage of you. And I, I think that that's just one of the things that might, might have led to some of the, uh, the bad outcomes that happened in some of these areas. Sure. Because you just didn't have people that, that had the same experience and the same 
unfortunately, opportunities that, that my team did in the corn gall. I, I, I want to get back to sort of the chronological sequence of things. I mean, there's a bigger discussion there, obviously, of how much you can actually take being in contact that often uh, without, you know, uh, one, things going bad, but two, mentally, you know, keeping yourself together. That the, the challenge of that seems almost near impossible, but, I, but we, we can dive into that more in a minute. But I wanted to get back to just chronologically for the audience. When you get to Afghanistan, you mentioned you, you, you were just saying before you took company command and you guys were getting ready to uh, you were getting diverted to Afghanistan, right? Yeah, so we're, we're getting ready to get diverted to Afghanistan. This is sometime in the spring of 2007. And it's May, June time frame that we start to uh, deploy to Afghanistan. And I think it's June 10th that the company takes control and is responsible for the Korngal Valley and, and the Korngal outpost as the, uh, the main base in the valley. And we then stay for 15 months. And, and redeploy 15 months later in 2007 uh, after after a hard fought 15 months. So when you get there, um, you know I, the mission is what it is, right? Hey, it's you know make friends with the populace, sort of try to expand your area, create roads, create opportunities for you know the the, the civilians to help you you know fight the Taliban and obviously hold the ground that you're in. Anything else sort of strange or, or out of the ordinary about the mission, or is that pretty cut and dry? I, I think the, I mean, it's pretty cut and dry. The only thing that I would tell you is that, you know, it was, it was one road. Um, the government was really not involved in the Korngal Valley in terms of investment or any access and placement down there. And as far as, you know, that the ink blot that you would hear talked about so much during this time frame of trying to spread influence, I was really just trying to connect with these people on a personal level. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I tried so much as to even like, I told them I was willing to even convert to, to a different religion, to Islam, like if, if it would help, you know, with our, our discussions and moving forward, um, just to try to find some kind of commonality. And usually the only kind of commonality that we could find down there is that I was a father and they were a father. And that we didn't want to do this for their sons or, or my sons in the future. Uh, but, but it was just really tough. It was really tough, Mark. You get there on ground um, and you uh, are obviously seeing contact early on. Were you prepared for the level of contact? I know you mentioned you guys were battle hardened, um, but at the very beginning of the deployment, were you prepared for the operational tempo you were walking into? I think we were prepared physically. And I think because of the train up that we had and the way that General, or Colonel Osland uh, kind of laid out our live fire exercise and our, our CTE immediately after finding out that we were gonna be going to Afghanistan, which was to say that we didn't live on the fobs and we were gonna have to be in these austere environments where we were living off the land I think that that got us in a position where we were more mentally prepared. Uh, but I think physically we were prepared for it. I think tactically we were prepared for it um, when we could see the enemy. Uh, but I, I don't know that we were 100% mentally prepared for what we were about to walk into uh, with respect to the terrain, uh, with respect to not, you, we rarely saw the enemy. And then the third piece was, just the constant, the constant sense of, of being at, at a heightened state of alert for so long, mm -hmm. um, it, it played on us. So as the first couple of weeks and months go by, um, how much, how many casualties do you guys sustain? So from June to about uh, October the end of October, which is when uh, Rock Avalanche occurred. Right. I was going to get to Rock um, Avalanche in a minute. I was just kind of curious leading up to it. So le leading up to Rock Avalanche, we had already lost uh, five soldiers. Okay. And 
I couldn't even tell you the number of uh, wounded in action, you know, purple hearts that we had. But what I can tell you is that 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 time frame leading up to Rock Avalanche mentally took the biggest toll on us. Why? Uh, because that's 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 when we were still we were still like fish in the barrel. We hadn't uh, completely established OP Restrepo. We hadn't completely established some of these other outposts and fortified them so the boys felt like they could actually sleep at night without being uh without being shot and the third piece was is that we were we were still in that hunted sense um we hadn't flipped or caused that paradigm uh to occur yet and we were averaging probably anywhere from six to eight ticks across five bases a day so the boys felt unease like they couldn't rest, they couldn't, they couldn't sleep, they couldn't, uh, you know, they, they couldn't turn their brains off. The second thing is they were constantly being pushed out there, knowing that they were going to get into a firefight and, you know, constantly asking the question to what end. And then the third and final one is, is we hadn't, we hadn't established our, our defensive perimeters to the level that we, we desired and needed until about that time frame in October. So when uh, Rock Avalanche kicks off, uh, or I should say, take me leading up to it, um, sort of the events leading up to it and how it got there, because I'm, I'm just curious, um, you know, your specific location as the commander uh, and how you were sort of managing all of this going on at the same time. Just to be specific, you want me to talk about how I managed Rock Avalanche, or do you want me to talk about everything that was leading up to Rock Avalanche? Well, I lead up to it, set the stage, and then sort of how you manage Rock Avalanche itself. Yeah, so as we're, you know, coming into the Valley, you know, starting in June and continuing to push through the summer months, like most units, it, it takes you about 60 to 90 days to kind of understand the operating environment, to understand the enemy, to understand your surroundings, and, and know what it is that you need to do to improve your fighting position know what you need to do in order to be able to go ahead and, and push back the enemy. And then number three, understand what your enemy's trying to do in, uh, in reaction to this new team that's just arrived in the Valley. Uh, so after I'd say probably, you know, August timeframe, we're starting to set in a plan to Firebase Vegas, which is on the Eastern side of the, the Valley for me only about 800 meters as a crow flies to that base, but it's a solid like five hour, six hour walk away from it because you walk down into the valley and then you walk back up the valley on the other side uh, to get to it. So very remote, very austere. It has, um, when we get there, it's a horse barn with only two sides to it and a roof and some triple strand concertina wrapped around it. And only about a kilometer away is where Red Wings happened, which is where um, Mike Murphy, the Navy SEALs, and Mike Murphy, yep. you know, get shot down. And so it's it's a known enemy safe haven, um, and they've got the high ground around us. So the guys are sleeping in a, a horse barn. They're living in flea infested, tick infested uh, squalor. And the only thing that they have to protect them is this two-sided lean-to and some triple strand concertina wire. Um, then you fast forward, or you don't fast forward, then you transition down southern in the valley, uh, Firebase Phoenix, which is at a, at a line where if they go any further south than that, no matter what they do, they're going to get shot. No ifs, ands, or buts. Um, to their... To their right, as they look southward in the valley, uh, is the high ground where Restrepo will end up being in place, but which is where the enemy is sitting in placing recoilless rifles, RPGs, and, and, and RPKs, a heavy machine gun, and they're just shooting right down on top of them every night. And there's nothing but a building that they're staying in. And for those that have ever seen a recoilless rifle shoot and hit something, it, it shoots right through these these adobe huts. So it doesn't provide them too much uh, in the way of protection. 
And then you move back to the Korngal outpost, which is where a third platoon is and the main headquarters, which is about 800 meters north of Firebase Phoenix. And at the, the center of the valley, it's surrounded by triple strand concertina wire, mostly. And the boys live in just green tents. So bullets travel right through that. In fact, we had a, a contractor who was out there to try to fix uh, something, get shot in the leg, and then we never had contractors come out for another nine months. <laughs> and you're surrounded by small outposts, ob observation posts, but they're not, they're not interconnected with any kind of fortification or wall or defensive perimeter. So to get out there, you got to go outside the base walk a couple hundred meters and kind of hang yourself out there. So there, there's no, there's no sense of security. There's no sense of protection. And how do you manage all this? Like, like this is a command nightmare. It's, it's a, um, it's, it's definitely stressful. The, the good thing is, is that I had a, I had an experienced group of NCOs that had done this before in a previous deployment to central Afghanistan they were, where they were in an austere environment. And I think, you know, that really benefited us. And I think the second thing that benefited us is that uh, it's, it's about survival. And, and the boys just realized early on that we needed to dig in. And I truly mean it, like filling sandbags and digging in, filling HESCOs with e-tools not with backhoes that are filling these things up in just a couple hours, but, but filling these things in with shovels and e-tools and, and helmets. Um, and over time, uh, we were able to bring in some Afghan workers that ended up having to live on the base with us uh, that we had to pull off the pest because we couldn't trust the Korangalis uh, to kind of help augment us and, and help us get this done a little bit faster. And we were ripe with huge amounts of lumber uh, because Korngal was a big lumber producing valley and had an incredibly high GDP for the, the country of Afghanistan before the war. And we started putting that stuff to use. And uh, I think just innovation and just hard work was able to win the day, but it took time. Uh, I mean, we started in, in late August and, and we didn't really finish until we left there, but I don't think anybody felt comfortable with it until probably the beginning of November. So you had about a, a 60 to 70 day investment before folks felt secure and protected. All right, so that leads up to it. Again, uh, I hope everybody can visually, you know, obviously if you've never been to Afghanistan, it's very difficult, but um, worst conditions imaginable. Let's just put it that way, as far as uh, uh, command and control is concerned and uh, uh, avenues of approach for the enemy to come and get you. Um, I'll just put it simply that way uh, for, again, for the civilians listening and watching. So from and, that and stand, add on to, go and, ahead. And excuse me, add on to that, that CNN during this time dubs it the most dangerous place on earth. I mean, so to try to depict this for people, it's think of the mountains in Northern Arizona, Northern New Mexico, desolate and rigid and rocky and you're surrounded by people that hate you and then arm them and tell them that, Hey, whoever it is that comes in this Valley is out to go ahead and steal your kid. And that's what it felt like I was walking into. Yeah. That, that, that's much better than I described it. I'm glad you're here. So, <laughs> um, all right. So as rock avalanche kicks off, uh, the intent of rock avalanche was what, like what was the, the mission execution of it? Yeah, so it was a battalion size operation. Uh, we had Alpha Company, which was on the, the Pesh Valley to our north, uh, which was going to go into a, another valley and try to push the enemy back uh, off the Pesh so that they could do some of the additional roads and services and, and government work that needed to be nurtured up there and matured. And then we had a sister company, chosen company uh, from you know, their time in Wanot and uh, the ranch house incidents were going into the adjacent valley to me, which was known as the Shuriak, uh, which is where uh, 
Mike Murphy and his team ended up having uh, having their one brother uh, escape to after their helicopter was shot down. Mm-hmm. And then you had Alpha Company, or I mean, then you had Battle Company, which was my company, um, push deeper into the Korngal Valley with the overall intent being we need to push the enemy back uh, so that we can go ahead and capitalize just prior to the winter the winter, you know, I guess recession in the fighting season uh, to go ahead and capitalize on some gains to allow us time and space to push some efforts along the Pesh, which is where it was more populated and and there was more uh, foreign internal investment. And the lead effort was battle company pushing deep into the, into the Korngal Valley to a Southern village known as Yakachina. Um, to do that, uh, we had to go minimally manned on all of our outposts and all of our bases in the Korngal, which consisted of about 14 of them. So we were stretched thin and we were accepting risk there. And we pushed two platoons to the south. And what they did was they would land south of this village, Yakachina. And I landed up on a hilltop 1709 so that I could command and control the element from on high with some snipers and with some mortars to be able to support them and to be able to go ahead and and observe what the maneuver forces were on the ground so that I could see the front line of trace and and direct uh, rotor wing assets and fixed wing assets as they cleared from south to north. Um, As soon as they landed in the middle of the night, um, we started getting chatter uh, you know, that the enemy was moving into position, uh, remotely piloted aircraft and other aircraft overhead. We're seeing people moving with weapons. And it was just a really testy moment that first night, uh, which led to a number of engagements. And by the next morning, the boys in the two platoons had cleared through Yakachina and that, and that objective. And we, we found some unfortunate side effects of, of that fight, which was a, a number of civilian casualties and a, a number of uh, caches of weapons and munitions uh, that the enemy had stored down there. And so as, as it kicks off, are you feeling like things are going successfully? I, I, I'm feeling like things are going the way we had planned. Okay. Um, I felt like we were going to walk into a hornet's nest and that we were going to stir it up. Yep. I felt like we were going to have the upper hand at night and we were going to be able to separate the populace from the enemy and we were going to be able to then close with and destroy them with minimum risk to civilian casualties. Um, I felt good about what was going on in those first 24, 48 hours, even after we flew down there and met with the local populace in Yakachina prior to, to moving to our next, uh, next phase of the operation. What are you telling your boss, Colonel Osland, at this point in time in the first 48 hours when you're sending sit reps up? Like, what's the what's the kind of conversation? What kind of questions is he asking you? He's relaying to me uh, what he's seeing on ISR because I can't see okay. it or uh, intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance assets, uh, predators and, and whatnot flying overhead. And I'm relaying to him what it is that the rotor wing H Apaches are are telling me and what I'm doing in terms of engaging with my own organic or attached assets. And what we're also picking up on VHF comms from our low level voice intercept uh, team that was partnered with me. So I'm listening to the Korangalis talk back and forth on their VHF radios. I'm hearing them communicate and, and tell us what it is that they're getting ready to do. And I'm relaying that to the boss. And what was great is that in his relays to what he was seeing overhead with ISR, we're largely mirroring up and we were getting some, some complimentary effects on the enemy as a result of that with fixed wing casts and, and rotor wing casts. Um, and, and I'm telling the boss, Hey, like, just keep on, just keep on it and keep on pushing me. And he's telling me the same thing the next morning. You know, one of the tougher calls I have to make and I got to call my boss and I tell him, hey, we've got kids 
and we've got them, they're wounded in action because of what it is that, that I did the night before, uh, the decisions I made. Um, and I recommend to them, I'm like, hey, my recommendation is this town has never seen the government of Afghanistan. This is the first time that they've seen us. Um, we need to go down there and we need to, we need to project, you know, the government. We need to project that we're here to help them and that we're not just big bad guys that, uh, that have green eyes because of our nods in the night and, the, and, and as the big bad voodoo daddy that they think we are. So the boss agrees and we fly in the provincial reconstruction team commander who's a Navy uh, colonel. We fly in the closest thing that we can find from a provincial governor type of individual from the Afghan government and the boss and myself and, and we engage with the, the elders in Yakachina, offer them some assistance and some aid. But the boss ends it with, hey, this is this is what happens when you harbor terrorists. This is what happens when when you don't push them away um, and, and you don't tell us about it. Can we go back to uh, those decisions you had mentioned uh, when you called your boss about some of the, the wounded that you guys had received? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, just lay, lay it off me. What, what, what was the intention and what was your decision and how did it play out? So, I mean, going, going into this kind of mission, being a battle space owner and responsible for, you know, kind of like what you said earlier with the company, you're responsible for, for all the good and the bad in terms of the actions of your, your company and your unit. Well, in, in my battle space, I'm responsible for all the good and the bad of the actions and events that take, take place in my battle space. And the impacts that that has on the local populace, just as much as the impacts that it has on my soldiers. And, you know, if you're going to win hearts and minds, which is almost a punchline to some folks today, you've got to appreciate that you just came into somebody else's backyard to their housing, their neighborhood, and you just kicked in their door. They have no idea why you're doing it. They don't appreciate you doing it. And you didn't tell them why. Well, I escalated it even further. I kicked in their door and I ended up hurting their son or daughter or their wife or themselves. And they don't fully understand it or they don't fully appreciate it. And you know, I just told the boss, I'm like, I feel like we got to go down there. and We got to explain this to him. Uh, you know, to quote Simon Sinek, you, you got to explain the why. And uh, in the hopes that that's going to win over some of them and make them at least understand why we're doing what we're doing, and that we're not doing it because we're just out here cold and heartless. Blowing shit up. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and I don't know that it necessarily resonates with them, uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it's the only thing I could think of to do. Uh, because it was going to probably be the last time I was going to end up being able to be in a position to to talk to these people and touch them. And I didn't want the only time that I did that to be with our boys dropping bombs and, and shooting at them and then just picking up the next day and leaving them high and dry without an explanation. Why the urge? I get the desire to explain certain things to our troops to explain certain bigger picture things that they might not understand to folks who are on our side. Why did you have such a sort of, you know, simple need to explain it to not necessarily those people with the enemy, but they were sort of the, the second and third order of effects of the enemy. But, you know, I mean, what, where, where did that desire come from, from you? Because I, I don't know, for me personally, I, I had plenty of actions with, with, with Iraqi civilians you know, they were all generally nice, you know, a lot of kids and everything else. We went to school sometimes and things of that nature. And I never thought that those people were the enemy per se. But a lot of people they knew generally were trying to kill me on a routine basis. So I was able to sort of emotionally separate myself from that. Um, why were you so drawn to that that sort of uh, need to explain yourself to them? So I'll, uh, I'll go back to when I told you that I think becoming a father made me a better leader. Gotcha. Um, when they, if they had just told me it was military age males, I probably would have been less inclined to push. 
Um, but uh, I deployed after my son was only three months old uh, for 15 months. And when the medics and the platoon leaders on the ground were telling me that we had incredibly young children that were hurt and maimed, um, I, I think it just, I think that that's just what pulled out my, my strings, my heart strings. And I'm a pretty stoic individual, but uh, I, I think that that's what probably did it. Um, I had an incident earlier on in, in Mosul where I came across a young girl, uh, Padma, and we had kicked in a, a building in, in an attempt to, uh, to detain a terrorist who happened to be her, her father. And when we came across her, uh, she was purple. She was cold to the touch. And fast forward three weeks later, um, we've got Elizabeth Dole, Bob Dole's wife, uh, reaching out to us as the president of uh, the American Red Cross to take care of this woman. I, I guess you could say I got a soft spot for, 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 for kids. All right. So as you know, Operation Rock Avalanche concludes, do you feel like you're in a better position now, at least for your guys in the short term, not only for their physical security, but their mental security as well? So at the conclusion of Rock Avalanche, uh, immediately thereafter, uh, the company was in disarray. Uh, we'd, we'd lost one of our absolute rock stars in uh, Staff Sergeant Larry Rugel. Um, you know, folks thought he was invincible. Um, and, and we, we end up leaving there with three KIA and another, you know, 10 to 15 wounded in action. And as we're coming out of it, we're feeling like we just got punched in the face and we're bloodied. Um, and everybody's kind of like licking their chops, but um, we immediately go back out there and, and get back into the fight uh, after, you know, giving everybody time to, to rest and recover for about 24 hours. And I think once the boys got back into their OPs and into Restrepo and Firebase Vegas and et cetera, I think they were able to start seeing that the enemy had been knocked down even harder. Um, it did help that it was the winter kind of, slow down in Afghanistan with a fighting season. Uh, but we were able to start transitioning into hunting them. Uh, had some initial success taking LRAF, uh, putting them up at Restrepo and being able to see much deeper in the valley so that we could call artillery on top of the enemy and calling CAS or close air support on top of the enemy. And it really, really just kind of changed the dynamics of the valley and, and put the enemy back on their heels. And I think, you know, folks would say that coming out of Rock Avalanche, that was the that was like the Battle of Midway uh, in the Pacific. That that changed the dynamics in the valley in a positive manner for the for battle company. So this is the beginning of your deployment. You're like 90 days into 15 months here. Um, we're, 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 like, we're like five or six months in, yeah. Okay, five or six months in, but still. Still got a I mean, year left. Yeah, I mean, you're, 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 you're not on the other side of the hill yet. Um, and so from that standpoint, realizing what you still have in front of you, um, are you starting to get at all, I hate using the word disillusion because I know it's not in your in your sort of mindset, but. Are you, are you beginning to wonder how much longer you, you guys can hold up against sort of insurmountable odds? It definitely was a daunting task that I think everybody looked at in terms of coming out of that and what, what we were to expect for the next you know, 10 to 12 months. Um, the good was that at that time is when we started phasing in the, the mid-tour leave. So people were able to go back and kind of recharge. Um, number two was we were able to, like I said, start capitalizing on creating some of that uh, mental security for the boys because we had established a lot of the, the protective measures or defensive measures um, that we needed. And 
I, I think that those two things combined really started to help us out. Um, as we continue to go through, um, one of the big things that I recognized, though, Mark, was, um, you, you know, as a soldier, you're, you're taught that you got to be physically fit. And you got to do PT every day to be able to stay sharp and, and, and physically fit. Um, I'm a firm believer that you got to stay mentally fit. And uh, to do that, I really was adamant about making sure that the brigade psych uh, came into the valley and, and was able to give me a, a good litmus test on where the, where the unit was and the formation was so that I can make decisions on how to rotate the formation into the more contested spaces on the battlefield. And I think that the same thing was being done at the battalion level because Colonel Oslin did it on two separate occasions, rotating the company by platoons back to Camp Blessing so that we could get warm food. We could sleep in a, a brick and mortar building and the boys could kind of take about four days and like take a shower and wash their clothes because they hadn't been able to do it for you know, anywhere between six to 10 months. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> um, how are you holding up mentally at this point? I mean, you talked about not being able to have any peers around you to talk to, to vent to, didn't want to vent up the chain of command, certainly couldn't look down uh, to there. Do, do you, at any point in time, are you taking your own mental stock or are you just like locked in and focused? No, I mean, I, I like I said earlier, I'm, I've been told I'm very stoic, um, but what was very evident and it wasn't evident to me until people told me this and the brigade psych told me is if you've seen uh, the movie Saving Private Ryan and you're familiar with Tom Hanks's character where sure. he, he keeps on um, shaking his hand, his hand shakes. That's exactly right. I, I, I was not steady anywhere. Uh, stress was coming out of me uh, through the physical, you know, materialization of yeah. manifestation of me shaking um and I, I had to be engaged about that um second is if i hadn't had the likes of uh sebastian younger and uh and tim hetherington in the valley on and off to be able to have conversations with that were very candid and open uh, it, it probably would have been incredibly hard. And then the last thing is, is that I, I had a sipper or secret phone mm -hmm. uh, that I could communicate with. And I had the luxury of my father being very senior in the army and having a, a secret phone at his house. And I could, I could reach out to my father. Um, if I didn't have those three things, Really, if I didn't have Sebastian, Tim, and my father, it would have been an incredibly difficult 15 months, and I'm not, I'm not sure how it would have come out on the other end. Um, my father just listened, and Tim and Sebastian, they just offered their ears, and they offered me kind of a little bit of insight based on what they were seeing as they were hanging out with the platoons. I, I wonder, you know, you said your dad just listened. Um, clearly, he's got a lot of experience, uh, combat experience at that. Um, any sage advice he gave you at all? Any advice that you, you remember? Yeah, so, I mean, my father was a, a, a combat vet. My dad was actually in command of Special Operations Command, Central Command. So he was actually in charge of that area of the world at the time. And... Uh, had jumped into Grenada and Panama. So, you know, the, the biggest things that, that he kind of led me is he's like, Hey, it's, it's one day at a time. Number one. Uh, number two is, as we talked about earlier is you, you can only take care of what you can control and, and only worry yourself about what it is that you can control. Um, and then, you know, one, one of the things that he didn't specifically say, but we talked about routinely is, it's not a popularity contest. Um, there was ebbs and flows, you know, where the, the boys are obviously questioned some of the decisions that I'm making and some of the tactics that I'm employing. Um, 
and it's it's hard when you're out there because you're not always a popular person based on those decisions. Sure. Um, I can remember I I went up to Sal Junta after Rock Avalanche, and he had just you know repatriated his best friend and gone through this incredible nightmare. And I tell him about you know the loss and in the same same statement i'm just like that was incredibly brave sal i was like i I think we're going to nominate you for the medal of honor and i think the first words that he said was fuck you (laughs) um and i can understand why right um that's that's the last thing that 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 young man cares about or or any of those boys care about or medals and recognition um but it goes back to what I told you I struggled with earlier on. It's like, how do I, how do I console this young man? He just lost his best friend. He he just went through something that I could never fathom. Um, And and to put it into context for the listeners, he once told um, Tim Hetherington and Sebastian that what he entered was like, there was more tracers than there were stars in the sky. He ran right into it. And I mean, when I, when you think about stars in the sky, I, I would tell the listeners to imagine themselves being out on the plains of Kansas or out in the deserts of, you know, California, and then look up into the night sky. Don't look up into the night sky in New York city or Miami or Atlanta, because you're still not going to be able to understand and fathom the sheer amount of stars fire that he's talking about. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and how much fire he was waving yep. into by himself. Sure. Sure. Um, how do you console somebody like that? You, you don't, and I failed. Um, and, and the decisions that I made circling that, those young men will never probably appreciate or understand. Um, it, and it, it's that that's what was the hard part. That was the mental gymnastics that I think we all went through uh, over the course of the next 10 to 11 months after Rock Avalanches. There was a lot of downtime. It's it's playing in your head all the things that happened. It's second guessing it. It's it's continuing to re fortify your position and wondering, just wondering when the next you know event is where the enemy is going to put hands on their soldiers. I mean, in Rock Avalanche, I had the enemy literally put hands on my soldiers two different times. I mean, those things scar you. They scar the boys, and you're constantly wondering if that's going to happen again and and how do you go ahead and and beat that back so um we we relied heavily on on any means that we could think of to kind of give those boys those comforts uh, that could give them an outlet like i talked about with my dad sebastian and tim but over time we were able to do that because we were able to get phones to them outside of just sat phones and we were able to get internet to them very very minimally Uh, But being able to open up that kind of connection to the outside world so they could feel like like more than just these battle hardened soldiers that were contained in this this globe known as the Korngal, I I think really was what carried the day for us. Uh, Moment of levity, just out of curiosity, what rank did your father reach? Uh, He was a three star general. Okay, your old man signed my bronze star. I just it hit me when Small you world. said it. It hit me when you said it that he was he was at Siege of Sodov. That's where yeah. I was. Your old yep. man signed my bronze star on my first deployment. It, small it, world. It literally just hit me. Very small world. <laughs> um, wow, crazy stuff. Uh, that that's unreal. This, and I, I didn't even put it together until I you know you said you talked about your father and, it, and it, wait a minute, Cuny. I know that name. <laughs> anyway, uh, I digress. Uh, back to more serious stuff. Um, you know, with all that that you were dealing with, um, you know, do you how much of the burden do you carry for what went on? Because look, as I said before, there's so much about combat that's unforgiving, unpredictable, and and random. Um, and that doesn't alleviate your responsibility, and it certainly doesn't alleviate your authority. Um, what it does, um, should uh, allow some level of empathy for yourself, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I'm not very good at that. 
Okay. Um, and I, uh, I've, I've struggled with it, uh, honestly, Mark. And uh, it, it's one of the things that I've really been trying to tackle and deal with this last year uh, because uh, I've been told throughout the years uh, that uh, I lack empathy and that I don't, uh, I don't show emotion. And I think it's because I've, in many ways, not grown callous, but I've tried to demonstrate this, this just even keel, this level headedness so that I can make those decisions. Um, while understanding the risk and taking the steps to mitigate it, but not allowing the emotion to overwhelm me so that I, I can't make those decisions. Right. Well, I, I think um, to, to a certain extent, that is a, uh, it, it's a coping mechanism, but it's also one way that we as leaders, you know, sort of create equity, right? If I right. can remove the emotion out of it and I can remove my feelings from the situation, I now am an impartial observer. It's rationalization in our mind that, and impartially and rationally, if I do X, Y, and Z, Y should, or, you know, X, Y, Z should result. And that is the best of all outcomes because that's the way we're trained. Now, the problem you run into, okay, is that it's not always X and Y, and you're not always looking for Z, but theoretically in our head, that's the way we push things. And so um, if we remove the emotion out of it, you know, uh, we, 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 we just think we, it's an easier decision to make. And I understand that. Um, and certainly me saying none of this doesn't make your job of dealing with what you have to deal with any easier. But, you know, soldier to soldier, colonel to colonel, I look at you and I just say, hey, brother, I mean, you know, uh, allow yourself the ability to be emotional about yourself but not be emotional about the people that you have to lead. Like there's a, there's a fine line there. Right. Um, now I, I appreciate it, Mark. And I, I hear what you're saying. Um, what I, what I will offer to you is that uh, it, it's something that I am, uh, I'm maturing into. Sure. Um, and I actually, I, I talked to somebody. I mean, I, I, I I've started doing that uh, over the last year to, Same. to make sure that I'm a better person. Because I go back to that thing, you, I, like you, I go to the gym every single day because I want to be physically fit and I want to keep that sharp. But I got to keep my mental uh, toughness and uh, and myself mentally fit. And that's not just at home, or in that, that's not just at work, but that's also at home. And where I see that this probably impacts me the most is is at home, because right. uh, you, you you tend to like I don't second guess any decisions. Uh, but I don't know what I don't know that's going on in this uh, in this complex thing called our brain and, and how I've been taken in those things. But I know that it's had an impact. Um, and at homes where I see that that impact is felt the most by my two sons and my wife. Right. Um, so we've been working through that. And, and that's been that's been great for me. Um, and I'm not ashamed to say that. But I mean, the, the, the good thing is, is that coming out of and I'm fast forwarding a little bit, but coming out of the foreign goal, you know, people ask me like, Hey, was it successful? I would tell you that it was successful. It's successful because of the following reasons. One, I came back with every single man that I took. They weren't all alive, but I came back with every single one of them. And I left no man behind. I can look at myself in the mirror and I know that the decisions that I made, I didn't make any that were immoral, unethical, or illegal. Mm -hmm. And then the third one is, is that I'm incredibly proud of what it is that those men uh, did in, in the face of just like you described it before, like the most horrifying place imaginable. Yep. Um, and, and coming out on the other end, um, I think that that's success for that deployment. Sure. Um, I wish I could say it was, you know, everybody came back alive, but, uh, but I can't. And, and I, I, I think that we're lying to ourselves if we think that that's, that's the only way to define success. A hundred percent. I'll say one more thing. You know, you mentioned before, it's not that you're calloused. 
Um, and I don't think you're callous. What I think happens to a lot of us is calluses develop around us, right? Just like working out and you get the calluses on your hands, right? Like oh, yeah. just from that skin gets rough and it's, and, and, but you know, you just have to get deeper underneath it to really get to something where it's going to hurt. And those calluses serve us well. They do, uh, especially when it comes to 15 month deployments, especially when it comes to understanding tough decisions that you have to make. Um, they, they are, they, they are things that we learn to live with and can use. But unfortunately, if you don't rip off the callus at some point in time and realize that there is real skin under there that needs repair, all you're stuck with is dead skin and that doesn't get you anywhere. And I don't mean to continue the skin metaphor, but you get what I'm driving at. I mean, you know, nah. combat just does that. It calluses you to certain things. And, and I'll be supportive in one more way because I'm, I'm realizing this myself, you know, as I go through my own counseling and as I go through understanding PTSD and more about it, um, simply, I don't want to pass it on to my kids. Like that to me is the driving factor behind all this. I don't want my kids to be yellers. I don't want my kids to snap. I don't want my kids to, to exude some of the traits that have been so ingrained in me for so long that I didn't even realize there was something wrong or it wasn't right because it's just the way I was. Uh, and, and from that standpoint, you deserve all the credit in the world for acknowledging those things about you that need to be changed, even if they aren't hundred percent for you, even if they're only for the people around you to improve their quality of life, that's still leadership. That's still what people should follow. And that's still something um, that you should allow yourself to be emotional about. No, I, I agree with you, Mark. And I mean, I, I think you, you said it and, and I agree with you is it's, it's really been able to look inside and, and say, Hey, I, I don't want to see my kids acting this way. Um, I, I, I've learned that, uh, Hey, if it's, if it's bothering me more or if it's causing me more consternation than what it does when I, uh, excuse me, when I got to take a shit, uh, then that's an emotional response and I'm making a conscious decision to allow that to happen. Um, so, uh, you know, every time you drive in traffic, uh, around Atlanta and you get stuck in that traffic, um, and you feel like person or doing something like that. Um, I never wanted my kids to be acting the same way that I am there. And it's taken me a long time to get to that place, but you can only control what you can control and you can't control the traffic any more than you can control sometimes the things that are going on in the battlefield. Um, and it, it's taken me a long time to, to realize that and come to that realization. In reference to the rest of the deployment, you know, obviously, again, you have Rock Avalanche, you, you know, you have South Junta and, and all that. Is there anything else about the deployment deployment from a combat standpoint that still stays with you? I think the, the biggest thing that I took uh, after that deployment and, and moving forward was it was a first time that I was really there after the unit returned for an extended period of time. So we redeployed back to Italy and I stayed on for another year uh, working for the, uh, the commanding general for the Southern European Task Force Station there in Vicenza, Italy. And what I saw transpire was the breakup of this brotherhood that had been forged together in the blast furnace of combat. And for all intents and purposes, these families that were forged together as a result of that. And we fractured them. We sent them to the four winds, whether that was to serve in other destinations for the military or back into the society. And we did so at a, at a very, very quick pace. And I don't know how much justice we did them by ripping out that um, that support structure uh, that I that I think some of these young men and, and, and women needed um, for instance like one young man in particular I mean he came in and he was a hot mess and had an issue with alcohol but when we got to combat and he didn't have alcohol he was an incredibly high-performing soldier and did incredibly well. 
Um, and then he came back into Italy and he's in the 173rd and he's waiting until he gets out of his enlistment a year later. And he just, just spirals and gets in trouble. And by the time he leaves, you know, the new chain of command is, you know, really taking it out on him and they don't understand and they don't appreciate what this young man's gone through. Cause it's a whole new chain of command. Uh, he doesn't have any of his brothers and sisters really. Uh, to go ahead and lean on to and to help take care of him uh, like we do with our family. And, and so that was one of the tough things that I saw as we redeployed and I didn't have a good plan. I don't know that the, the unit had a, had a good plan for kind of addressing and taking care of that. Um, and it was still nascent with social media and being able to stay connected the way we can today with these virtual platforms. Uh, so I, I think as we continue to go ahead and, and deploy folks for another decade, uh, we were able to go ahead and kind of allay some of those risks and fears. Uh, but I, I think those that uh, that have served and have gone through that same situation could probably empathize with what it is I'm talking about. No, sure, a hundred percent. And what's What's crazy is after explaining all this and the emotional and physical toll that it's taken on your body, you still got about 10 deployments left. <laughs> yeah. uh, this, this goes on for the better part of the next, uh, what, uh, 16 years uh, of your career, um, you know, for what, what, 10, 11 years, 12 years, whatever it is. Um, and and I, I, well, I can't get, you know, any sort of, uh, you know, it's hard to encapsulate 10 deployments in any, you know, significant amount of time that we could cover here. but uh, what about that deployment, um, was what you carried the most with you, not only from a leadership standpoint, but just from whether it be tactical or, uh, anything else that you always, you know, sort of just was one of your hard, fast sort of lack of a better term command philosophies going forward on every other deployment. No, a hundred percent. I mean, one, one of the things that I'll do until they kick me out of the army, if I'm in command is, uh, we will dig in and there's no amount of time that we will sit on a piece of terrain and not start digging in. Um, like I said, rock avalanche, when, uh, we were in a patrol base, uh, they overran a small outpost that was, you know, meant to be able to identify the enemy early and give early warning. And they didn't dig in. We didn't have sandbags filled. We didn't do the things that I knew were correct. And I think too often than not, we had taken for granted because of having rotor wing support or fixed wing cast close air support over the top of us or ISR and drones over the top of us to give us early warning. Um, and, and we, we got punched in the face. Um, I will not make that mistake again. And that that's scar tissue. Number one, um, Number two, I am incredibly, incredibly persistent about having a very detailed fires plan that incorporates uh, both organic and artillery and fixed wing casts and aerial fires uh, to be able to go ahead and place that on the enemy. Uh, because until you don't have it, you don't, you don't fully appreciate it. And I don't think uh, during my train up for any of my deployments to include those as I, I moved along after the corn gall, we did the, the requisite train up with artillery and mortars uh, that is needed to, to fight like we did in the corn gall. And so I integrated my mortars all the time, even when I was in a ranger company deploying, deploying overseas. And then the, the last thing, is it's it's about family and uh i think those that have deployed understand it there's something that that just there's a bond it's a brotherhood it's a it's a sisterhood but it's a family and uh, when you're in command or you're the big brother um you're not just responsible for those that you're serving but you're also responsible for their families back at home um and and those are the three big key things that I took from there on uh, because we had all sorts of things that impacted us during that deployment, both 
in the Korngal Valley and, and back at home in, in Italy that we had to deal with because all those things play on the boys' minds when they're in harm's way. How much of that crew do you still keep in touch with, if any at all? Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest with you, Mark. I'm, I'm horrible about staying in touch. Um, <laughs> and even in the environment that we have today, but there's, uh, there's probably a close like handful uh, that I'm in touch with on a, on a routine basis. My first aunt, first aunt Lamonta, Lamonta Caldwell, uh, he teaches uh, at a high school that's uh, a sister high school to my sons. And so I saw him every single week for the last uh, four months because he was coaching cross country and my son was running cross country. So that was really cool. Um, and I see Sebastian Younger uh, probably about once a year, get to talk to him every so often as well. Um, and then a, a number of the, the platoon leaders, depending on where they are in their careers, uh, we, we, we engage and I give them some advice. Uh, but the, the younger men, the, the enlisted and some of the NCOs, uh, I've largely lost touch with. Um, and that's unfortunate because um, those are my, those are my little brothers and nobody messes with my little brothers and I'm not around to protect them to this day, but uh, it's something that uh, I recognize in myself and I'm, and I'm hoping one day I, I, I make better on and, and staying in touch with some of them. Um, I, I want to get to Sebastian and Tim here and, and the movie itself in a minute, but I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you, uh, since you are still serving, uh, as the events of last August unfolded, or this past August unfolded, and, and the Afghanistan war came to a close, um, not asking for any political statements, just what did it do for, what did it mean to you? What did it do for you? What sort of reaction did you have to everything as it went down? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's oddly enough, Mark, um, I'm going to address two, two retrogrades for you. One, uh, the corn gall and then the second one, the H Kyle one. Okay. Um, so I, I, we leave the corn gall Valley in 2007 and we hand it over to another unit from first, um, first infantry division. And I redeploy to Afghanistan. I, I believe it's in 2009 or 2010. And during that deployment, I'm in the I'm in the Ranger Battalion, and we're beginning to retrograde from the Korngal, and I get to be a part of the planning for that. I get to be a part of it. Um, I help with the the fires planning, with the phasing in, and with the support that that came from the the special operations community. So it kind of gave me that closure, and I got to see it unfold. And how it unfolded was nothing short of, of remarkable because there wasn't a single shot fired. Wow. Um, and, and when in my head, I would, you know, rewind back to like the first day and the last day. I mean, the first day I landed on the corn gall, we got into a firefight and the last day I was in the corn gall about to get on an airplane or a, a helicopter and fly to Bagram. Um, my flight got delayed by four hours because we were in a big firefight uh at the cop and i was like this place is never going to let me leave it, it was like a horror <laughs> film i thought i was just going to get sucked back in um to fast forward into august of 2021 and i'm at 18th airborne corps and i'm literally working with centcom and 82nd planning the retrograde of, of afghanistan i'm i'm helping to sequence the force flow in and managing that and informing, you know, all the senior leaders. Whatever it is that's said out there, what I will tell you is having watched it, Mark, is that that is a feat that people will talk about in the history. There's no other nation. There's no other entity outside of the Department of Defense that could have executed what it is that we executed in terms of just moving the sheer volume of people out of Afghanistan as fast as we did. And then all the way back to the United States, um, right, wrong, or indifferent, how it all unfolded. Um, I can tell you that I'm glad that my son will never likely have to go to Afghanistan. Amen. Yeah. Um, and again, and so that that gave me closure too. being being able to be part of that 
um, as, as I reflect on the corn gall, this one kind of gave me closure as well. And I, I'm sorry to cut you off there. No, no. I mean, it's, listen, Hey, it's, uh, it's your story. Um, you know, and, and I think it affected all of us in different ways. Um, it, it, it was one of those things where, uh, I was there for the close out of Iraq and, uh, watch us leave there without a shot fired in anger. And so, um, without seeing the, and having the benefit of knowing the exact plan from start to finish and the whole picture of it, you know, uh, certainly I can Monday morning quarterback and say, there were things I think we should have done differently, could have done differently. But again, I don't, I'm not operating off all the information. Um, but that said, uh, it, it's worthwhile to highlight uh, in the short time frame that in the short suspense, purely from a military standpoint, in the short time frame, in the short suspense we were given to be able to pull off what they did and move that many people as quickly as they did, um, like you said, I, I think is commendable. Uh, obviously, you know, the loss of life is, is nothing that we ever want to um, want to have happen, but we acknowledge that, you know, uh, it, it's part of the nature of the job that we do. Uh, and so from that standpoint, uh, we, we by no means are those lives given in vain because of how many we saved on the, on the outside of it. Um, but still, uh, I just don't know for, for guys like you, who, who bled so much there and lost so much there. Um, if the way you sort of go out, um, matters at all, if that makes any sense. So be, 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 before we close down, um, as I, as I mentioned before, as we, before we closed out Afghanistan, that is, um, I'd been over there 11 or 10 times. And what I can tell you is that in my analogy of how coin, you know, moves, it moves at the speed of glacial thaw. Mm -hmm. um, from 2001 to 2021, I noticed significant efforts that were in indicative of us moving in the right direction there. Um, were they necessary lasting efforts? You know, I, 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 I can't comment on that. Um, but I saw positive things trending. Um, I saw, you know, a number of things go that I never thought would happen. Like the Pesh Valley had a paved road with lights on it and an ATM. I, I literally took money out of an ATM on the Pesh Valley. Um, like that's mind boggling to me. Yeah. Um, I, I, I literally remember flying into Bagram and then going into Kabul and Kabul just looked like a war torn city. And then on my last deployment, leaving Kabul and Kabul looked like Times Square because it was all lit up and had all these glowing lights and stuff on it. Um, I don't know that that necessarily indicates that it's better, uh, but I do believe that there was progress. Um, but, you know, what's, what's the cost of the United States in order to go ahead and maintain and continue to secure that? Um, I, I, I can't make that decision and I can't comment on because I don't know Right. Uh, but what I do know is that uh, nobody should be looking back on that in, in my mind and thinking that it was, it was a waste. Um, I, I truly believe that our actions and our efforts did save some lives and did better some folks' lives um, in the end and gave them an opportunity to do things that they probably couldn't have done before. And I think you see that, you know, however, However little it may be, you, you see it in the news today when you see these random one-offs. I think it was the Afghani girl who's missing her nose who was captured on Time Magazine. And, and then now she's like doing these great things. Another gal that, you know, escaped Afghanistan and she's a doctor. Um, I, I don't know that those things would have happened if, if we hadn't have done some of the things that we've done. And I don't know that we wouldn't have had another event like we did on September 11, 2001, had we not done what we've done. Small victories, Dan, small victories. Exactly. Uh, th th again, uh, you don't have to win them all, but just win some of them. And uh, sometimes it's enough. All right. Uh, so you're going through the middle of your career and obviously, and by the way, Sebastian Younger was actually on the Hazard Ground podcast 
Uh, you can just go to our website or Google Sebastian Younger has her ground. I forget what episode it is, but uh, it was a fantastic interview. Uh, and it's always, always great to see combat through the eyes of those who don't have to fight it, right? Like uh, when, when, the, when they live it, but don't fight it. Uh, it's certainly right. an interesting perspective. Um, but that said, uh, you know, these were guys, uh, Sebastian Younger and Tim Hetherington were, were guys that you considered friends. Uh, obviously, confidants that you had mentioned before, them being on the deployment with you. Uh, when do they come to you? When do they tell you that they want to make Restrepo into a movie? <laughs> Um, not that they were asking for your permission per se, but I'm like, no, you know, no. they were going to do it. Like, when did you first hear about it? Yeah. So I can't even think of how many times these gentlemen came over. Um, they became like soldiers on leave, just coming and going so often that, uh, I, I treated them like they were one of the soldiers, but, uh, Sebastian came over initially with some chain smoking out of shape photographer. I can't remember what his name was. Uh, and they got into a big firefight and Sebastian quickly realized like, Hey, this guy is, is going to be a risk, uh, to, to me and to the soldiers. And so I've got to find somebody who's a little bit fitter and who can capture everything that I need him to capture. Cause what Sebastian was working on, he was working on something for, I think it was ABC news. And so on his next, engagement he brought tim hetherington over there and tim hetherington had already produced a, a number of documentaries one uh which he was acclaimed for with uh liberia liberia and uncivil war and i think it was at the end of that engagement with sebastian and tim on that second trip the first one for tim they were like hey there's something here we don't know what it is but instead of just capturing some stuff for the news, we think we're going to, we're going to self fund this and we're going to go after, I don't know what we're going to capture something. Um, it was after rock avalanche because Tim Hetherington was with us for the entirety of rock avalanche and uh, actually broke his ankle uh, the day before or the day of, uh, the big ambush uh, that Sal Junta uh, ended up receiving the Medal of Honor for and had to be evacuated out. And it was after that I got a note from Sebastian and Tim that indicated, hey, we're going to invest our money and we want to do a documentary. And we want to capture the single platoon for the entirety of the 15 months and we're going to just keep on coming back and it was you know probably then about november oddly enough it, it, it probably had been veterans day because that was probably the only time i could get to a phone or to the computer and actually check anything and uh and that's when i first heard it did it seem far-fetched to you that there was you know, something there or, or did it, was it something like, yeah, this is going to be, you thought this would make a great story. Did you have any initial reaction or it's just sort of one of those other things that you have to deal with while in command? So <laughs> <laughs> um, two things. One is Sebastian already had a, a personal relationship with some of the soldiers in battle company mm -hmm. because a year and a half prior, he did a vanity fair article on battle company in central Afghanistan as he followed them around for, uh, a short period of time. And so he wanted to come back to that same team and, and do it again. But uh, I didn't have any say on it. My boss, Bill Awesome, was like, hey, we're sending Sebastian out there. He wants to see you guys. And as we started to make the news back at home, as I stated earlier, CNN dubbed us the deadliest place on earth, we became like a tourist safe haven. Um, everything from print and, and video, we're trying to come out there and, and touch the magic for lack of a better term and see where the, the fight was in Afghanistan because it was the unforgotten war or it was the forgotten war rather. And Iraq was at the height of its surge uh -huh. and they wanted to go ahead and, and, and talk about this, this place. So at first I was kind of, overwhelmed with all the different media coming out there and the boys were very reluctant uh, to open up and to engage with them. So I usually 
took it upon myself and the command team to kind of hold that off of the boys and just move around the battlefield with them. Um, but Sebastian and Tim were different. Uh, they, they kept on coming back. They invested in making the right relationship by investing in coming physically fit and trained and ready to, to do what it is that we were asking the boys on these missions so that they didn't put them at risk. And so that kind of won us all over with, with Tim and Sebastian from the get go. Um, at any point in time, did you think, given how much you guys were getting into it, that it was unnecessary for them to be taking this risk? During Rock Avalanche, I had Tim Hetherington with me. I had Elizabeth Rubin with me. I had a <clears throat> Lindsay Adario with me. Mm -hmm. And I had a, another young man named Balash Gardy. All of them critically acclaimed journalists and photographers in their own right. And I was incredibly concerned about their safety, almost to the point where it was a detriment to my ability to execute the, the operation the way I saw fit, uh, because I, I didn't want to put them at risk. Uh, because they weren't armed uh, and because they would at times kind of put themselves at the front of the formation to try to get those cool snapshots or to try to be able to see uh, the fight in action. Um, I mean, Lindsay Adario, she ended up leaving uh, shortly after Larry Rugel and um, was taken off. Uh, after he died on the battlefield and uh, several other men uh, were wounded in action. And Tim Hetherington, Elizabeth Rubin, and Balash Gardy stayed, but uh, the guidance I kind of gave them all through the platoon leaders or face-to-face -face was, you've got to stay behind it. I, I, I can't handle this. I can't make decisions. If you guys are up front, you got to understand that. And I believe that they all finally appreciated that more so than they may have in in earlier instances, uh, because all of them had been out there multiple times and for extended period of time with us. Um, funny how reporters get in the way. Just made me think of a story uh, real quick, anecdotally. Uh, it's just at the very end of my deployment. I think it was like a, a, a week before I had left. Um, they made me go pick up a New York Times reporter uh, in the green zone. And uh, I was so irritated and so frustrated that I had to do it. I was pissed off because it was just like one more mission. I didn't need to be bothered with. I'm like trying to right seat, left seat with the unit replacing me, trying to get out of here. And they're like, hey, why don't you go take all the Iraqi guys that you trained and go pick the guy up? And I'm like, fine. Uh, and because it was a short trip to the green zone um, and I've done it, you know, two dozen times easily, didn't take my interpreter, didn't take a map, didn't take anything. I'm like, we'll be back in 10 minutes and just hurry up, go get this guy and get back. Of course, we go there, we go pick him up on the way back. We roll over an IED, uh, you know, we get into a firefight and then we end up getting back safely where, you know, nothing really happens. But I just remember being so pissed that I had to do this for a reporter. And the, and the strange part is, is that dude embedded with the ISOP brigade that night and they got into a firefight again. I'm like, that dude's bad luck. Don't ever have him back here. Leave him home. He doesn't need to be here anymore. I'm trying to get exactly. us killed. No, uh, I mean, I, I can empathize with you. I had I had an incident where James Gandolfini came over, you know, Tony Soprano yeah. came to Mosul and he was like, hey, I want to see everything. And my boss was like, Dan, take him out. And I'm so worried about him. I wouldn't have reacted this way, but we started taking mortars and I ran and jumped over a fence. And as I'm coming over the fence, there's a tree branch right here in my head. Oh, God. I just square up, <laughs> knock myself out. And I got Tony Soprano carrying me into my striker so that we can get out in the middle of this. And I'm just like, what the hell? I mean, uh, why am I doing this? Yeah. Well, listen, I mean, that's, that's a hell of a story. If you got Tony Soprano helping you out, you know, yeah, uh, it could be worse <laughs> people doing it uh, anyway, but uh, all right. So those guys are there. When you first get to see the film, what's your reaction? Um. My first reaction is, this says everything 
I don't need to say anything to my mom anymore. Uh, my mom asks me all the time leading up to, you know, all these deployments, like, Hey, how are you? You want to talk about it, et cetera. And I'm like, I, I'm good. I don't want to talk about it. There's nothing to talk about or something to that extent. And the movie, the, the documentary kind of laid it out. So I didn't have to have those kinds of conversations with her. Um, the second thing that kind of came to my mind is a, this is completely apolitical. And the third thing that I walked away from is that this captures everything about the boys. I mean, don't get me wrong. There was cringe worthy moments. You're a company commander. I'm now a major in the army and you're watching the guys like put two privates together to beat each other up. And all I can think of is some general officer or sergeant major being like, Oh, you endorsed hazing. And I'm just like, Oh my gosh. Um, but you know, you, you're watching the boys. There are prolonged periods of boredom. And I think that America, and I think that most people, because of Hollywood, they think that war is 12 months of the invasion of Normandy on, on loop. And it's, it's absolutely not. It's largely just long periods of boredom. And then these short snippets or spurts of your life is on the line. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, it's the two so, extremes you could possibly think of, bored to death and scared to death. And so, and so I think that that captured it and it showed it. Um, and it didn't emphasize any one more than the other. Uh, but it did play out very much in the, in the tempo of the way that the, the deployment went. I mean, it was very high intensity early on. And then it, it started to drag off as we were able to start taking it to them. And, and I thought that the, the movie or the documentary did a very good job of, of doing that. Restrepo did. And, and getting the feedback from the men afterwards was almost uh, a la band of brothers where you had, you know, like Dick Winters kind of commenting and some of these other older men talking about their journey uh, from Dakota, Georgia, all the way to the Eagle's Nest you kind of had the same thing take place here. I mean, these guys are talking about partying with their stepo on the train in, in Venice. And they're talking about how they end up going through this 15 month deployment. And then you, you kind of end with them on the same train, but you end with uh, Staff Sergeant Alcantara talking at the top of Restrepo to the platoon about them going home and, and getting ready to pack out. And you see all these guys kind of gearing up for that. And, and I think it just tells that full story. Um, and there's the highs and lows throughout that, that I, that I think you see. So when I, when I say, Hey, it allowed me right off the bat to, to think, Hey, I don't have to talk to my mom. This speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. I would like to think it did the same thing for a number of other veterans, even those that didn't right. serve in battle company. Um, what did you see about yourself in the documentary uh, that you, oh, that you didn't like? <laughs> was there anything that was cringeworthy? So many. Um, <laughs> Pick one. Yeah. The, the, the worst was when we were in the, uh, the sheriff and the way that I was talking to those gentlemen. Um, There's a part there where I think the corn gollies are talking to me and I, shoot right off of the bat that uh, I don't really fucking care. And I just come across incredibly lacking of any empathy or any willingness to, to be open-minded. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Like that's just one of the 15 months of every single week having a show with these guys and hearing the same stuff over and over again. And, and you're bound at 26, 27 years old to just reach a point of like zero fucks. Yeah. No, I, uh, I, uh, uh, I remember it quite well when I, when I heard inshallah enough to the point where uh, it was no fuck your God, get there when I tell you to get there. Like, you know, that's you, you, you reach a breaking point of, of there's only so much, you know, uh, if God wills it, you can take that uh, you, you uh, have no, no choice but to respond with some level of authoritarianism and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and lead from the front. Right. 
Um, yeah, I'm, I'm about to will this, okay? Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, did anybody, uh, did you come across anybody after it came out, whether in your chain of command, outside of your chain of command, anybody reach out to you and say, hey, you know, send you a positive note, a positive message, uh, even a negative one, I suppose. I mean, did, did anybody, you know, militarily kind of talk to you about it? Um. I never had any direct engagement negatively from the military. There was uh, some some negativity that I heard through second and third hand, uh, you know, comments, uh, but never directly from anybody. Um, I think one of the more profound uh, things that occurred as a result of the movie coming out was my father had a, uh, let's just say not a very good relationship with General Casey, who was the chief of staff of the army at the time. And when that documentary came out, General Casey called my dad personally and was like, hey, you tell your son that he has nothing to worry about and job well done. And we, the army is going to support him. Wow. You know, throughout it. And that, I, I think, you know, just because of knowing the relationship that, that the two of those gentlemen had and, and him being big enough to, to call and, and then state that uh, was rather profound and, and, and impactful. I was and, so not expecting that to be what he said when you started leading into that whole thing. Yeah, I was yeah. I so not no. expecting that to be the outcome. Um, but what I, what I can tell you, Mark, is that uh, a, a ton of support and a, a ton of folks that um, I, I think could empathize with it. But at the same token, uh, you, you get a lot of, you get a lot of negative press too, because people think that like I asked for it. Uh, people think that like Misha Pembelvelkin asked for it uh, and that we had a choice in the matter. And you have people that, uh, that attack you and, and, and think that, you're you're out there promoting promoting this documentary uh only for personal gain and uh th that was probably one of the more harder things to deal with uh with the aftermath of it but so minuscule in, in comparison to all the positives that came out of it uh just a couple more thoughts here you know uh, hollywood in general um has hijacked us uh for their own financial gain um, and, and it's not all bad. Um, I mean, hell, professional sports have hijacked us for their own, you know, financial gain. Uh, and it's not all bad. Part of me, it makes my skin crawl. Uh, it's something I hate. I wish the Department of Defense would step in and say, everybody get the hell out of our business and let us go do what we do well. Um, we appreciate the thanks for your service, but we don't need these, you know, no matter how big your American flag is, it doesn't make you more patriotic than, right. you know, the one little pin I wear on my shoulder. So you know, save it all. Like, honestly, it, it's, it's, it creates more harm for us than good. Uh, hence why our chief of staff is up there answering questions that he should never have to answer, but different discussion for a different day. Um, that said, uh, looking back on all this, um, you know, do, do you feel like what was portrayed and what was put out there has done more benefit for everybody than necessarily harm? Um, you know, I, I haven't, I haven't ever thought about that, that aspect of it in terms of how it influenced and maybe supported some of the narratives sure. uh, that, that are out there, uh, being stoked by, by the media and, and, and by Hollywood. But, uh, what I will, what I have, what I have run across, Mark, and I can only speak to what I've run across, is that it's, it's been more positive than good. Um, I have young lieutenants and NCOs from all the different services that have come up to me throughout my career and here recently, and been like, "Hey, that movie or that documentary helped solidify me coming into the service." One, hey, you're your depiction or your depiction of leadership is is something that I, I took a number of lessons uh, both positive and negative from and uh, have really helped me 
And I've had family members come up to me and say, hey, th this really helped me better understand my, my son or my daughter. And so I, I believe it's been more good. And I think the target audience for, for Restrepo and how it continues to play today is probably targeting the, the right folks. And it's really targeting those that have loved ones that have served uh, or they've served themselves. Um, and I think early on that, that target audience was the broader uh, you know, nation. And I think it served to tell that purpose. However, the media and, and Hollywood use it today. I, I don't know if it would, I don't know that it would, it would, it would do the same if, if that makes sense. No, sure. Certainly. Um, and I, I, I think, you know, feedback, good, good, good and bad. Also, you know, it, it helps craft who you are. Right. I mean, it, so often in our organization, um, our only feedback comes from written reports, right. Um, and, and negative feedback comes in the form of ass chewings and things of that nature, but that, that sort of unfiltered raw, you know, Hey, sir, I appreciated this, or, you know, this was something that made me think a little bit is some of that feedback that I think as leaders, we should get more of and desire. I mean, that, that's your command climate survey, right? Like it, it's almost, that's what it is, except in a verbal format expressed through a documentary that, you know, we, if, if, if you had a documentary of everybody's time in command, right. Or everybody's time as a platoon sergeant, you'd, right. you'd get a much different rating than what people put on paper. So th there's some of that that needs to happen, but you know, the, the, the hope is that leaders, good leaders are in, are introspective and they're looking at those things themselves along the way. It uh, doesn't need to turn into a leadership discussion, but you, yeah, I think you know what I'm driving at from that standpoint. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want to ask you, would you do anything different and, or, or do you regret anything? Because uh, given what you went through, I, I think those, you know, th there aren't clear cut answers to that. Um, sure. We could all have done things differently, tactically, um, operationally and things of that nature. But I, I guess I will ask that um, if you're doing this all over again, is there something that stands out to you that you would look at a different way, look at a problem a different way, look at a mission set a different way and try to execute differently, if that makes sense. If, if, if I had to do it all over again, knowing what I know now, I think the lessons learned, I would have, the only thing I really could have done or would have done different is probably uh, implement them sooner, build, build or strepo sooner. Um, fortify and, and make those defensive investments up front and, and sooner. And the, the only thing that I, I would do right now uh, that is different um, is I would do better at in staying in touch with the gold star families. Yeah. Um, I've got nothing but excuses. Everybody's you got to make time and I haven't made time. That's, that's the number one thing that I would, uh, I would do different. Um, and, and I can, I can make that change now. I'll, I'll throw my own two cents in. Um, the one thing that, that, and I only speak from this from personal experience. I wish I had addressed the shit that was going on in my head sooner. I, I, I wish that I wish that I had took the time to recognize, you know, that there were things that were um, affecting me in ways that I didn't want to realize were affecting me. Or I'm fine; it's not a big deal. I'm a functioning adult, right? Like I I can handle all these things. I, I wish that was that was something that. As you go through it now, you, you, it's so obvious to say, why didn't I do this earlier? It's, um, I'm going to steal that one from you. I would do that too. And I would, I would do it because um, I was raised by a man who served 36 and a half years in the Army. And, you know, it was, I hate this terminology that it was old school, but it was just a different time. You didn't Absolutely. talk about yeah. your emotions. You. Oh. <laughs> You, you just kind of did it. You sucked it up and, you, and yep. you drove on. I. In fact, that ability to suck it up and drive on is what got us promoted. It, it, it is. And I'm, I'm okay with that. Uh, but 
it goes back to what it is that you and I said earlier. I think that I would have been a, a less miserable person for the last uh, 19 years. And uh, I probably would have had a, a better relationship with my, my kids. And uh, them being 14 and 12 right now, unfortunately, they probably know more cuss words than most sailors as a result of, of me not addressing this earlier. So uh, I, I, will, I will take exactly what you offered and I will add that to my, my repertoire of things that I would change. There you 100%. go. hundred percent. Well, listen, I mean, uh, for what it's worth, again, it's been a couple hours, probably one of the longer episodes that we've done here on the show, but it's been worth every, every second. Uh, I learned a lot from you. Um, and, and I appreciate your, your willingness to just be so open about all this stuff. Uh, it, it's never easy. Um, and again, as I said, going through it, you tell the story, sometimes you just hit a different note every time you tell the story and it just hits you in a different way that you, something re-energizes in your brain and, and, and it, and it can be really tough. It can be really difficult to deal with. So I certainly appreciate, um, you be, being willing to share a lot of this with us. Uh, and look, there's so much more to your career than just 15 months in the Corongal Valley. Uh, and I know that, and, and I know, you know that, but, um, for the purposes of the audience, that's what we wanted to focus on. But I, I would be remiss if I didn't tell them that, you know, one deployment does not make a career. Uh, one good deployment doesn't make a career. One bad deployment doesn't make a career. A, a, when you do this for as long as we've done it, um, there's always ebbs and flows. There's always ups and downs. And there's there's always things that we wish we could have, have changed the outcome of or, or done differently, whatever. You know, all, all the cliches are there. But still, uh, I, I wish you nothing but continued success. And, and I continue to implore you, uh, just like I tell the rest of the listeners on this show, you know, um, at some point in time, I wish I had taken a knee every now and then in my career, just step back and taken a knee and taken five and, and given myself the, the time and the ability to take a mental break because I needed it. Um, instead of just sucking it up and driving it on. Um, and when you're on the back nine of your career, like we are, I'm afforded that opportunity a little bit more. And so I would encourage the same to you, you know, take a knee every now and then give yourself the mental vacation. You know what? Go play those nine holes of golf because you've earned it, man. Uh, it, 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 it's okay to take a half day off. Uh, guess what? The army will still be there tomorrow. I figured out that much. It's been around for 247 years now. Uh, it's no, no sign of slowing down. So I think we're going to do all right one way or another when we hang it up. But uh, all, all that together, man, I, I can't thank you enough. I, I, I thank you so much uh, for everything that you've done. Thank you for being the leader that you are and continuing to, uh, to lead troops everywhere uh, and everyone that you come across. And, and certainly, you know, just an amazing story. Thank you for sharing. Now, Mark, I, I really appreciate you guys inviting me on. Um, like you said, every time you have this opportunity to talk, somebody brings up something a, a little bit different that, that makes you think about something that you might not have in a long time and, uh, and, and it hits. And, uh, I, I appreciate that. I don't know that I would have done this, uh, you know, maybe 10 years ago. And then last but not least is, uh, is thanks for your service and your family sacrifices. And, uh, and I wish you the best of luck. It's really good to see somebody like you doing this and, and giving a voice to, to those that out that are out there and listening um, and, and that need to hear, hear this stuff because there's a lot of folks out there in America that, that love the veterans and want to help. Um, and they're not just flying big, big American flags. They actually right. mean it and they're willing to listen. So thank you. And, and to that end, you know, I, I always tell people um, one of the great things about our show um, that we never intended was, you know, in a sense, we're chronicling history, just like you were able to say to your mom, just watch this and you'll know everything. Somebody who did an episode on the show will be able to say, Daddy, what'd you do in combat? Go listen. You know, it, it's right there. It, it's right there for them all. And then come back to me with questions. But to that story, if you really want to honor, honor a veteran, honor their story and take time to listen to their story, because their individual story really is what their service is about, right? Not everybody else's. So we tend to paint a broad brush. Oh, all veterans are great. And every, every, every service member is great. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But, you know, um, everybody's story is different and no two people take the same path in, in the military. And so uh, not, not one was more important than the other. They're just all one big part of the pie and you don't get a pie without everybody in it. So, again, thank you so much. And, and Colonel Dan Kearney, thanks for being part of the Hazard Ground. Now, thank you. You guys have a great one. You've been listening to Kill Cliff's Hazard Ground podcast hosted by Mark Zeno. If you have an interesting story to tell, and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at producer at hazardground.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.